up, YouTube? Hey, Kel here with my special guest. Uh, hi, I'm Mijo. I'm a Korean activist. Also run a Korean feminist reading group called Suryoshim. When you say you're a Korean activist, what does that mean? I am active within the Korean labor rights movement, okay. um, also the feminist movement, and also the queer rights movement. Okay. I work a lot with organizations and individuals who will be trying to organize events, protests for the advancement of um, human rights in Korea. He's about to drop some real knowledge on you guys. Today we're talking about suicide in Korea. We do not understand overwhelming rate of suicide in Korea linked to college age students and young children. All we know is too much pressure. From what you know, I heard before I even had come here is suicide rates in Japan and Korea are very high if they don't get into university. I know you're going to clarify that for us. We want to dig a little bit deeper than that. We want to get to the root. Where does this pressure come from? Why is it here? Where can we even start with this? I feel like the best place to start is um, basically the statistics. Mm -hmm. um, when we talk about suicide rate, um, if you look at the statistics for the OECD countries, so the countries that most people would term developed countries, Korea has been number one since what I believe is 2001. So we're about mm -hmm. 14, 15 years in of the number one suicide rate of the OECD countries. And since 2008, we have never fell between 14,000 people committing suicide a year. And what's the age demographic on it? Look at the leading causes of death mm. by age group in Korea. From the teens to your 20s, it's suicide. From 20s to 30, it's suicide. From 30 to 40, it's suicide. And then from 40 up, There was camp. something in the news that had come out about two girls, high school or middle school girls in Tegu yes. that had committed suicide. I believe they had said something like the school system was just too difficult. We have to start talking about history here. So basically the Korean schooling system, if you don't know, school starting time is 8. It's been a while since I graduated. Mm -hmm. High school students, you end school at 10 p.m. God so, dang! 10 so, p.m.? Yeah, after your main classes, there's what they call yagan chairu haksa, which means um, nighttime self-study. This also kind of factors into the whole pressure thing. It's mainly because a lot of these kids don't have time or energy right. to uh, relieve stress or other mm -hmm. pressure, especially because there's also a large private education sector in Korea. We have Hagwon. The Hagwon is a private educational institution in which they offer classes. And Let me just ask this before you guys think, oh, she's stupid, she's ignorant. You know, I'm asking questions that I may already know the answer to, but I'm asking questions that I'm thinking you guys might be thinking, and I'm just trying to like dig out and dispel a few myths. Is this a thing of keeping up with the Joneses? Is this, I want my kid to be better and more educated than your kid? There are aspects of that. Uh -huh. um, when what? you look at Korean sociology, what they mention is a very important part of Korean society is the concept of chemyeon, which if you translate it to English would be the concept of face, of mm -hmm. Saving fate. It's I didn't know there was a term for that, but that is so prevalent in this country. That's another video, man. Okay, continue. It's not about actually being honor honorable, or it's not actually about being or embodying a certain concept. It's about showing that to other people. Right. About maintaining an appearance. But there's also a much more deeper aspect to it. What we're talking about is these, this concept of the hungry junction. Um, the term junction means um, a mentality a way of thinking and hungry is hungry um, but what this idea comes from is after the Korean War when basically poverty was widespread a large part of the people who grew up in that generation right now is our parents generation and these people grew up in poverty now not your grandparents your parents yes my parents generation would have been roughly born or in okay. their childhood or uh -huh. puberty what happens is that they develop this mentality that never again mm -hmm. so that raising of socioeconomic status is extremely important of being able to maintain an income and provide for you and your family what also happens in the post-war era is because the whole country is destroyed the socioeconomic ladder of the statuses has pretty much been wiped clean besides from a very few people who are able to maintain um, material wealth. So from the 70s to 80s, 
people who were educated were able to get extremely good jobs and you, my parents generation was going through high school was going through college if you got a good education you could get a good job you could suddenly mm -hmm. go from being absolutely poor to making millions of dollars every year mm -hmm. especially in the in the budding economy through education so they're they're saying that through education, education yeah. this is the way out of poverty yeah and so the connection between education and this hungry junction it starts getting formed in the early 70s in the early to late 70s because you have the hungry junction which is so obsessed about raising your socioeconomic class and then you have this connection to education this obsession gets moved and starts is transferred into education and so right. we start seeing an fixation and an obsession about education. If you consider the analysis of, say, activists like Coretta Scott King, who mentioned about how poverty is violence, then you can start, you can start to think about how Now that's deep. Poverty is violence. Now that's deep. You can start to see how this whole hungry junction can very easily be seen as a almost traumatic Mm -hmm. a response to right. the post-war situation of poverty. So uh, we're seeing kind of like a post-traumatic stress yes, disorder. Right. This post-traumatic stress disorder is starting to be um, manifest socially. But you have the Japanese colonization mm -hmm. period followed immediately by the Korean War, followed immediately by the post-war starvation period, and then followed immediately by the military dictatorships uh -huh. which dominated the Korean government for about 20 years and then you're followed immediately by um, situations like the economic crisis starting from 2008 and so on and so forth and so what you start to see is intergenerational trauma mm -hmm. we're talking about people who went through the Korean War mm -hmm. and didn't have access to medical or psychological uh, help which would basically not diagnose the so, PTSD treatment. Can I see if I know where you're going with this? Yes. So there was no access to medical help to treat this, you know, PTSD. They don't believe it exists. Exactly. They don't believe that there is this stress. Is there a word for stress in Korean? Not really. So I don't understand that. I hear the kids say it all the time. I'm under stress. You know, back home, your parents would say, what do you know about stress? How are you stressed out? You're only 10. What's there to be stressed out? But I can see that kids here are stressed. The fact that there is no Korean word for stress, I mean, I'm just guessing, is that they're not treating these problems as problems. They're not seeing them as problems. It's true. Um, basically, with the PTSD from my grandparents' generation, what happens is that because they're not getting treatment, this affects how they relate to other mm -hmm. people and how they interact with other people. And the first people who are affected by this mental illness is their immediate family. My parents' generation is basically a generation which grew up having to deal with untreated PTSD with their parents, having to deal with a broken form of interaction with their parents. Interaction is normalized. This type of interaction is seen as the standard now. And what happens is that when my generation comes by, we're having to deal with parents who see this interaction which was originally formed by PTSD mm -hmm. as normal as how they should act as parents. And then they interact with, our, with my generation in the same way. They go home and they don't have people who can emotionally and psychologically support them because our parents didn't grow up learning how a lot of mental illness treatment is very much stigmatized. That's what I was trying to And then the high pressure work environment in Korea. Common issue is called yagen or late night work. You um, don't go home till the boss goes home. Yeah, you're not... A <laughs> You don't go home until until your higher-ups go home and first. And he's sitting in the office watching TV. Exactly. 